I opened the door and the TV was on and everything, the drapes was closed. And I'd shouted for Lisa with no answer. And I looked and I looked again, I was in shock. Kaylee was laying there. She looked like she was asleep, but she looked like she'd been beaten. And I'll tell you, that's been the, the worst time in my life ever. What did you think when you first read this case, girl? It's a very shocking and sad thing when you read that a six-year-old little girl died along with her mother. Lisa Bennett was a 29-year-old single mother who was crazy about her six-year-old daughter, Kaylee. What kind of person kills a six-year-old? I think that whoever killed them killed her because she was a witness to him killing the mom. Because oh, yes. No one would want to kill a six-year-old sitting on the couch coloring in her coloring book. On June 6, 1993, six-year-old Kaylee was found by her own grandmother lying on her living room floor, strangled to death. Police later found Kaylee's mom, Lisa, in the back bedroom. She was also strangled. You know, and it was like a sloppy killing, too. He killed both of them in the same manner with whatever he had available right there at that moment. Yeah, because this is not a killer that wore gloves and who's real smart. This is a different no. kind of killer. This is a sloppy killer. He should have left something behind. This week, in addition to interviewing witnesses and suspects, we are having all the items from the crime scene that appear to be touched by the killer retested using the most up-to-date DNA technology. Kaylee would be 27 years old today because she was six when she was murdered. Yeah. It's been 21 years. Yeah. A grown woman with her own babies. Yolanda and I are both moms, so a case like this is the kind that you try your hardest on, you pray the hardest on, you work the hardest on. You just have to. I just know we can't leave this town where a mother and a six-year-old were murdered and not clear this case. We can't. It's been 16 years and still no the answer. Police consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Hi, how are y'all? Kelly. Very young. Nice to meet nice you. you. Nice to meet you. It's Scott Tagmeyer. Oh, nice to meet you. This is our deputy chief. Deputy Thank chief you so Paul much. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming, working with us. Well, we're excited to be here. Y'all have a very good reputation, you know. People good. say good things about y'all from all good. over. The extra pressure which y'all already feel is because of babies involved. I mean, we all know that. I mean, we can have just a little bit of luck and y'all can put this one away. Sounds good. It's always more traumatic to work a homicide with a child, especially if you have children of your own. You go home and you see your children, and you're just thankful that they're still with you. You must be Alan. Yeah. Carrie Young. Alan, Alan Brown. Nice, nice to meet you, Carrie. This case has a lot of physical evidence, but it also has some potentially uncooperative witnesses. So it's great to have Alan Brown because he has so many years of experience working on homicide cases. How do you guys want to start? We want to start with you running down your case to us. OK, um, June 21st, 1993. Um, Irene Worling, who was the grandmother of Kaylee and the mother of Lisa Bennett. She was supposed to call her daughter in the morning. She tried calling several times, didn't get an answer. She ended up going to the house, found the front door ajar. She entered the house, immediately saw her granddaughter laying on the floor, Kaylee. First officer on the scene said he walked in. Found Kaylee face down with a cord wrapped around her neck eight times. She was strangled. As he searched the house, he found Kaylee's mother, Lisa, in the bedroom, laying partially on the bed, naked from the waist down. She had a bag over her head and a belt wrapped around her neck. Who do y'all want to put up first on the suspect board? Bryce. That's Bryce. Bryce McGriff. McGriff. He was the current boyfriend. And married at the same time. 
She was looking forward to the fact that maybe he was going to come over that night because he was due to come back into town. Bryce had gone to a family function in Texas the weekend of the homicide. Lisa was anticipating that he might stop by after his return flight from Texas. I wrote down 11.30 to 1.30 is our window for the murder. Yeah, your time frame's right. And his flight landed at 10 o'clock, yep. which puts him right in the time frame. Bryce also has a history of domestic disturbances, which could suggest a possibly violent past. OK, who's your next one? And that would be Franklin Douglas. What are we going to call him all week? Frank or D. Frank or D. What do you want to put up here first? Okay. Ex-boyfriend. Ex-boyfriend. Ex and he, he's got quite a few. We got through old reports of him abusing. Other women? Yes. She learns the night before that, that you know, he's living with her friend, her best friend, Stephanie. According to witnesses, Lisa finds out that Frank actually has moved in with her best friend, Stephanie, on Saturday night, the 19th, one day before the murder. Everybody said that she was off the chart mad on Saturday and Sunday, complaining to her sisters, her mother, and everybody about Franklin and Stephanie living together behind her back. And the threats she made referenced the robbery. The night before the murder, Lisa goes over to Stephanie's house, bangs on the door, and yells out to Frank, I know you robbed that store, and I'm telling the police about it. So she's threatening to send him to prison. OK, so I'm going to call those threat slash motive. Lisa believed that she had information about a robbery that Franklin had committed, and she threatened to go to the police with that information, so this could have been our motive. What's the family say about you cranking all this up again? I mean, they, they've waited 21 years. Jackie, Yolanda, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Must be Miss Irene. Hi, Yolanda, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Kelly, nice to meet you. Nice it's bad enough if you're the mom who loses a child. Irene Worming didn't just lose her daughter, she lost her granddaughter. It was just devastating. You know, I never, never had an idea in my life that I'd ever witnessed something like this. Last time I spoke to Kaylee, she called and she wanted to come over and spend the night and i said to her why don't you wait until tomorrow because papa's going to work and he won't be here i woke up early that morning and i thought things were something strange going on in my gut you know and i started calling her around six o'clock and getting no answer and i don't know what it was it kept drawing me to lisa's i opened the door and the tv was on and everything the drapes was closed and I'd shouted for Lisa with no answer. And I looked and I looked again. I was in shock. I thought Lisa Kaylee was laying there. She looked like she was asleep, but she looked like she'd been beaten. And I'll tell you, that's been the, the worst time in my life ever. I just, um, I just wished that I had got them to stay that night before. I just wished that. What bothers me the most is that little girl fought when she was born, and I know she fought going out, and I hate that. I hate it. Okay. I just don't understand how he can hurt a baby. I mean, it's bad enough they took my sister, but I felt like she was one of mine. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible, I don't even know. I don't know what she goes through. I can never imagine in my wildest dreams what she has gone through. Nothing has been that bad as when they were murdered. How much do I miss them? If I could cut my heart out right now to bring them back, I would do it. Well, you already know that the Fort Wayne Police Department has never given up. And we're hoping for that little bit of God or luck or whatever you want to call it to push the case Pray far every enough day along. For that. Do you? Yes, I do, really. Like I said, I'd never give up hope. Never. When you meet a family like Jackie and like Irene, and all they want is to find out who murdered their sister, their daughter, their granddaughter, they're not asking for a lot. They just want the person who did it to be held accountable and have to pay and be punished. And that ought to happen for everybody. 
I don't know that crime scenes get any easier. I think you just learn to put your emotions where they need to be. Ultimately, you'll have to deal with those emotions, but you learn to deal with them later. Instead, do what you're supposed to do so that you can help these victims that you're looking at. This tells a true story for you on what happened in there. You're watching Cold Justice present We're investigating the murder of six-year-old Kaylee Bennett and her mother, Lisa, both brutally murdered back in 1993. So basically the couch would have been here? Yeah. The main couch is set up the same now as what it was back then. Okay. Kaylee's in the middle of the floor. Yeah. Laying and watching TV. There. It makes you wonder, though, if, if the blanket is there, she's got her coloring book, she's got her food, she's got the TV on. You know, I don't think a six-year-old sets it up so nice and proper. Her mom set her up there because she wanted her to be self-entertained while what else is going on. This case doesn't appear to be a random intruder for a lot of reasons. You don't have forced entry. The only thing that seems to be missing is a VCR that seems to have been grabbed as the killer left. It would appear that the person that was in the house was probably known to Lisa and Kaylee. She's sitting on the bed. You know, like they're discussing, arguing, and for whatever reason, it all goes wrong at that moment. Our suspect grabs a belt, puts it around her neck. Action around her neck. And he pulls back. The whole mattress shifts off the box spring. The belt snaps from our suspect pulling it so hard on her neck. You can see there's definitely some struggle going on here. She's got bruising. Grab marks. Yes. And she was fighting. He then grabs a plastic bag, ties it on her head. So suffocation and strangulation. The combination of the both that actually killed her. Her dress is underneath her, like sitting on the dress. Mm -hmm. All right, so he's killed her. And then he just takes the dress and goes like this, because this part's still under her for right. the douche. One strange aspect of the crime scene are the two empty bottles of feminine douche, which appear to have been used recently. Next question is, did she have sex with this person? Because I think he's trying to get rid of any of himself in her at all. It's possible that Lisa had sex with her killer that night, and the killer might have used the douche bottles to get rid of any physical evidence that he left behind. This person also takes her purses, looking through it, I'm assuming for money, drops her driver's license. His exit is going to be to go back through that front door and out of here. But. Now we have a problem, because we have Kaylee sitting here. This person's already thinking strangulation. He takes that cord, wraps it around Kaylee's neck eight times, then just drops her where she falls right onto the floor. And walks out the door. And then walked out the door. I had a case once where the mother and a child were murdered. It was a capital murder. And the guy used uh, a lamp cord, you know, that, that you plug in. And he used that to strangle the mother. And DNA came back on the lamp cord. So I was really hoping that cord would have some luck. Or the belt that was around Lisa's neck. It better. When this murder happened 21 years ago, DNA testing was limited to biological fluids only. Let's put up some of our evidence. We actually have quite a few pieces. But now we have the ability to detect DNA left behind by something as simple as the touch of someone's hand. She had a bag that was placed over her head, a belt tied around her neck. So with such a messy crime scene, so many items in play, we do have a sexual assault kit. We are practically sending everything off to the lab to be tested or retested in hopes of catching our killer. I mean, that's murder weapon stuff that you know he touched, and if we think that he's in a frenzy, he's not wearing gloves. No, no, no. God, there ought to be something there. Okay. Lisa had dated both the suspects, Franklin Douglas and Bryce McGriff. So we're going to talk to anyone who knew Lisa back then or the men that she dated in the hopes of better understanding her world. Did you know if Lisa had any other boyfriend? 
No, uh huh. She was dating. His name was Frankie or Frank. In your recollection, can you describe this gentleman again the best you can? So tell us about Frank. Bitch, you ain't right in the head, man. Everybody knows he's not right in the head. Well, she had told me he he had been in trouble, I think, for drugs. I think mm -hmm. that's why he was in, I believe he went to jail for a while. And I just, I thought he was a shady character. Franklin Douglas was an addict who, when he was interrogated 21 years ago, said he was out that night getting high with his friends Garfield, Trigg, and Dwayne Hall. How are you, sir? So Garfield is one of the only people who can confirm Franklin's alibi that night. Do you remember D? D, that's what I'm trying to picture, D. That's from 99. I just can't picture You don't look familiar at all, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they say, I don't know that guy, and you think, oh, they're just covering. In my head back then, I was... Drugging, drugging and drinking. But the perfectly acceptable explanation for that is that Garfield Triggs' brain is completely fried about what happened in his life 21 years ago. Well, let's hope for Dwayne Hall. All right, we need him. Now there's only one person who can confirm Franklin's alibi for the night Kaylee and Lisa were killed. Dwayne, nice Dwayne to meet you. All right, how you guys doing? Good. You just want to hop in front here and does uh, the name frank franklin douglas ring a bell to you as to d oh so that's d right oh okay yeah well okay. and there's his that's name all i know him by is d He's i never knew about, about franklin douglas or anything right what i can remember is that i was just sitting up in the house he came by unexpectedly and uh knocked on the door and he's like man you want to get high i was like yeah i don't Oh my! I said, "Well, we can't hear because my kids is here." Right. So I, I decided, "Well, we'll go over to my friend Garfield Trigg's house." We got high over there, and then after all the, the drugs were gone, then he stayed over to Garfield over Garfield's house, and I walked on home. Was yeah. Was D high that night too? Oh, we all were high. Everybody. Me, has. him, Garfield. Yeah. Franklin says in a statement that after you got high, you went out to a club. No, no. No. <laughs> I ain't go to no club. I was too high to go to a club. I was trying to make it home. Well, that's all. What Frank's stating you guys did together, and we're trying no. to establish from your aspect and point right. of view I and whether he's telling us the truth or he's lying. I, that's a lie. In 1993, loving mother Lisa Bennett and her six-year-old daughter Kaylee were tragically murdered. The alibi of one of our suspects, Franklin Douglas, has been called into question. Franklin says that after you got high, you went out to a club. That's a lie. Now we need to focus on the days leading up to the murder so we can understand Lisa's relationship with Franklin Douglas and with Bryce McGriff. You want to just have a seat over there, Tracy? Tracy Starks was a friend of Lisa's who reached out to the police in the days after she was killed. I called them and told them because I knew how terrified yeah. she was. How terrified she was? Oh, yeah, because she was just real jittery. The last time I saw her, I went over there and she was every light that passed her window, she would jump and everything. I was like, what's wrong with you? She just, she started talking about her boyfriend and stuff like that. What was she telling you about her boyfriend? Tell us about what her fears were. I know she said that he threatened her and said he was going to kill her. She was scared, and, and it escalated where she was really worried about it. Did she say why he was saying he was going to? No, I have no idea why. Did she say who the boyfriend was? No, she didn't. OK. Tracy told us that Lisa was afraid of a boyfriend she had been dating. So Scott and Alan are headed to Texas to talk to the man she was supposed to have a date with that very night. Hey, Bryce, Alan Brown. Bryce McGriff. I'm a retired homicide detective from Houston. How long did you know her about it? Maybe a week or two. So really? I'm not, not, I didn't know that long. Even though I didn't know that long, I was going through so much, and I, it was like, it was somebody I could talk to about my problems, too, what I was going through. And that's the kind of like, relationship we ended up having. Then that happened, and that was done, you know? So when they broke the news to you that Lisa and Kaylee were murdered, I mean, you became very upset. 
Can that you... was the only person I had to talk to. Yeah. That's what nobody could understand. Bryce clearly had feelings for Lisa. That was the only person I could talk to at the time. That was the only person. But we need to verify his whereabouts on the night of the murder because he comes back into town right around the same time Lisa and Kaylee are murdered. Lisa was killed on a Sunday night. Okay, and that would be the weekend that you say you came to uh, Dallas for the family reunion, correct? Well, no, I flew out because it was a bad storm coming in and we ended up getting delayed. It was Sunday night, I made it back into uh, Fort Wayne after 10 o'clock. But I know I had called, tried to call her a couple of times when I came back because I was still at the airport. I remember trying to call her, mm -hmm. but nobody else. And you didn't go by her house after no, that? No, I didn't airline go by her house. But when you got back home, after your airplane landed. Do you call anybody down here to let them know you made it safe or? Uh, man, I don't even remember. Believe it or not, I okay. don't remember. Were you living with your wife at the time? Yes, we were still living together. But you're in the process of a divorce? Yes, yes. When you fly in from the airport, do you have a car at the airport? No, no. Okay. She had to come get me. She had to come get you? Yeah. Okay. There's nothing I can see motive-wise as to why Bryce would want to kill Lisa. But we still need to check his alibi to make sure he's still telling the truth. Hello? This is Detective Tagmire with the Fort Wayne Police Department. I got your number from your ex-husband, Bryce. OK. And I'm uh, currently working a cold case that happened back in 1993. And uh, at that time, according to Bryce, you and he were on the verge of splitting up. Yes. Well, during that time, uh, one of the young ladies that Bryce had met uh, and her daughter were murdered. Wow. And uh, the actual uh, weekend of her murder, Bryce stated he had flown to Texas for a family reunion, and you and the kids didn't want to go. I guess where I'm going with this is, did you ever pick him up at the airport? Oh, gosh, no. No, 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 no. I would remember that easily, carrying around toting young kids. Bryce's ex-wife just completely blew his alibi out of the water. Definitely not. I could tell you for a fact that Lee did not pick him up. Investigators are tracking down the detective who originally interviewed Bryce McGriff in order to compare his statements about his alibi. There it is. Set it down there? Yeah. But in the meantime, one of Franklin's exes has agreed to talk to us about her relationship with him. This is Kelly. She's helping me on this case. OK. And you were with him for how long? Probably six years. Why don't you go into what the relationship was like? It was good at first, and then he ended up doing drugs. He would take rent money, and he stole my daughter's. What do you do with the TV store? I think he sold it for drugs. How many times in all this relationship would you say he stole things from you or your house or your kids' things and went to buy drugs? Probably a dozen. You know, stories about Franklin pawning electronics makes you think of that VCR that was missing from the house that night. This is kind of an embarrassing question, but I need to ask it because of our case. Did he ever, like, have this weird thing about wanting you to douche before sex, after sex with him at all? He had a discussion with me about douching. Yeah. Really? See, I just think that's so odd. Yeah. First, you have the VCR, and now we have Franklin talking about douches, and we have douche bottles in the sink that night. I mean, it was a back and forth thing. He was evil while he was on the drugs. When you talk about evilness, what do you mean by that? When I was pregnant once, he pushed me up against the door and grabbed me. Grabbed you by the throat? Yeah, he scared me because he, he would foam at the mouth. He would get so mad and angry, spitting, and then white foam would be coming down. Yeah, and that's how I knew. Get away. Get away. Franklin's aggressive behavior toward a pregnant woman makes you wonder what the heck other aggressive behavior he has in his past. Or me, Douglas, born in 1945. 
Army Douglas is Franklin Douglas's uncle. Are you Army? Yes, I am. Shout out to King Hound. King Hound. And he once reported a violent confrontation he had with Franklin to the police. He tried to kill me. We was inside my son's house. He, he pulled a gun on me and shot down between my legs. And I went out. I just left and went outside and started to get in my truck. And he came out and said, you son of a bitch, you won't bother nobody else. And pulled the trigger and it wouldn't, wouldn't fire. It misfired. How did you first hear about what happened to Lisa and Kaylee? I heard it on the news. On the news. Yes. And, and when they mentioned her name, I said, is that the girl that D came over here with? Gene said, I think it is. And I asked him, I said, man, you heard what happened to your, your woman and your little girl? He said, yeah, I heard about that. I said, did you do that, D? He said, no, I didn't do it. He said, man, I couldn't do nothing like that. Kill that little girl. He said, I love that little girl. He denied it, so that's all I could say to him. But you flat out asked him. Oh, yeah, I asked him. What do you think about his denial when he's telling you he wasn't? I didn't believe him. Didn't believe him? No. Especially after the stuff he tried to do to me, and I'm his, I'm his blood relative, he tried to do it to me. No telling what he would do to somebody else. With more and more witness statements raising questions about Franklin, we need to clear up the other potential involvement of our suspect, Bryce McGriff, before we can move on. How are you, sir? I'm Kelly. Kelly, hi, my name's nice Al. Nice to meet you. Detective Al Fiegel was the original investigator who interviewed Bryce McGriff in 1993, right after the murder. I, I talked to him quite a bit. You actually looked at Bryce because he was supposed to come in at 10 o'clock that night. He landed at 10 o'clock at the airport. Back then, Bryce McGriff told Al Fiegel that he had driven himself to the airport and left his car there. So he was able to drive himself home the night of the murder. So maybe he forgot today what he said back then, and it's all very understandable. The first question I had to these guys was, hey, do you happen to have the phone records on Bryce? Al also looked into the calls that Bryce claimed he made right around the time of the murders. You verified the long distance records? Yes. With his alibi for the night of the murder confirmed and no real motive for wanting Lisa dead, we need to figure out whether or not Bryce even needs to stay on our suspect board. Are y'all good with crossing him off the board as one of your suspects for good and for always? Yes. Alan and Yo? Yeah. All right, so we can tell your prosecutors that you've done all the to-dos on Bryce McGriff. With Bryce eliminated, all of our focus is now on Franklin Douglas, the suspect whose alibi was disputed by Dwayne Hall. Franklin says that he went out to a club. That's a lie. However, Dwayne still was the last person to see Franklin before Lisa and Kaylee were killed. Franklin wasn't seen again until 1 in the morning. This is Kelly. She's helping me out on the case. Nice to meet you. When he came home to Stephanie's house, the girl he was living with at the time, who happened to be Lisa's best friend. Lisa called, and she was, well, you know this ends our friendship. And I said, you know, Lisa, I'm sorry. I never meant for this to happen. So if Franklin did kill Lisa and Kaylee, we're hoping that Stephanie will remember something that happened that night when he came home. And uh, it was, I think, about 10 to 1, the night of the murder, mm -hmm. right? I remember him coming in, and I thought he, had a, he looked really funny. OK, do you know that what you're talking about right now is the most important thing you'll probably ever talk about in your whole life? Yeah. Why, and why is that? Because two people got murdered. You said he looked different. Be more specific. Tell us everything you can think of. He always got a weird look about him when he smoked crack. It's like his skin got darker and his eyes looked funny. And I mean, I could just tell. What, was he sweaty? Well, I, I remember, you know, trying to touch his hands, and he didn't want me to touch his hand. And he got down on his knees, and he starts crying. I'm like. What, what's wrong? And he goes, oh, I messed up. I made a mistake. I slipped and I, I smoked some crack. I go, you know what? I just, uh, I'm going to bed. I don't, you know, I don't even want to. I can't deal with this. It's so frustrating to think that Stephanie just went to bed when there's so much information she might have known that could help this case. Did you ever directly ask him? if he killed Lisa and Kaylee? I, no, I just said, I, 
Why not? I just said I didn't trust him. I didn't know. I can't say that somebody did this because I wasn't with him. I don't know. I mean, the fact that a friend and a child is murdered makes me sick to my stomach. I've told you everything. I just want you to believe me. That's the whole I can't say something I don't know. Although suspicions are growing around Franklin Douglas, without Stephanie giving us anything, we don't have enough to build a circumstantial case. So the DNA results we're waiting for from Sorensen Labs will be an essential part to finally putting Kaylee and Lisa's murder behind bars. I told Carrie last night, if this case doesn't come back with DNA, I'm gonna cry. Oh, God. And you know I never say that, right? No, nope, you know. No, I will cry. And here's our call. This is Carrie. Hi, Detective Young. Yes. Um, so if you have results... Okay. Okay. The douche model applicator, both suspects are excluded as contributors. Ouch. The victim's oral swab, that one was also a mixture of at least two males. The victim's dress has too many male contributors for us to do comparisons. Is that two males? Too many. Too many. Too many. Okay. Hearing there are too many male contributors on a piece of evidence makes me think it's contaminated, especially since this evidence was collected 21 years ago. Okay, the cell, three contributors. Those contributors could be suspects, but they could also be police personnel or even lab personnel. What's next, Kimmy? Uh, the plastic bag, um, that has more than five male contributors. With the age of this crime scene, unfortunately, most of it is inconclusive. These DNA results are devastating. They're about as bad as you could get. It's one thing when an item comes back inconclusive, you can still work on building a circumstantial case. But with these results, you've pretty much established reasonable doubt as a defense argument for anyone to make. 21 years ago, they didn't have some of the rules and regulations. This in was place. right before O.J. Simpson, guys. O.J. Mm -hmm. Simpson changed the world of collection, so no one did it right back then. Okay, here, here. The DNA has has lost us the case in the mind of the prosecutor. All right, all right. so let's let's regroup. The only answer is then for you to make a hard, hard run at Franklin Douglas. Is that your last shot? What do you think? Well, I don't think that Carrie and Scott could walk away unless they do this. I agree. Then you better be crossing all your fingers and all your toes and hoping for a miracle. You don't have any weapons on you now, do you? Even? Do you remember what you done the night Lisa and Kaylee were killed? I have no idea. No idea. Do you remember what you told the police back then? No. You don't remember that? No. That's a big deal. I mean, it, it is a big deal, but I you just don't show the police where your alibi is. You I don't did. remember that? No, I don't, man. I was up back then. I'll be honest with you. You weren't and up today, when you were with the police. And and as and today, you know, I have problem remembering things. You know, I think I'm, I'm having the same thing my mom had. You know, she's suffering from uh, dementia. You know, you know, how many double murders have you been interviewed on? One. One. Like you said, you, you didn't go to the funeral because Stephanie told you no, not she to. she told me not to. Why? Because the family hated me. For some reason, they were stuck on me. I was the one that, that murdered her daughter. As detectives, what would come into my mind right now is why you remember the particular detail as to why you didn't go to the funeral and who told you not to go to the funeral but you can't remember the other significant details. I, mean, I can remember some things, but well, not you, everything, you, you know? can't tell me where you were that night and what you told the police the next not. day. I can't tell you where and I was last week. That's my point, there. is that you can remember that, but not the other important details. You the see what I'm saying? The important details is I didn't kill nobody, man. 
I mean, I know y'all out here doing your job, you know, and I appreciate that. I hope you find the person that did it. But I'm not the one. Franklin's interview is disappointing, but it's not surprising. Good luck with the guys, man. Carrie and Scott had to give it a try and do their best, but none of us are surprised by what happened. We can't criticize y'all for lack of trying. Well, that was He's smart. It's a good interview. Y'all went for two hours, and all of you couldn't have done any better. So what are you thinking, Carrie? Well, I'm going to go back and review the evidence again and make sure there's not something that we missed. I mean, it's just... It's far from over. I was thinking this morning, Yolanda, we haven't had to do this for a while now to go give bad news. And uh, I forgot how awful it is. This is going to be difficult. I mean, I really, really thought we would solve this one. And we didn't. This is going to be hard for Carrie, too. Yes, it is. That's why I need to talk to him. Because I don't think that it's right to make that family think that there's something else he can do. He can't do anything else. Kerry is not going to give up. He wants to spend the rest of his career working on a case that, honestly, no prosecutor would ever take. The unfortunate truth about this case is that our DNA has created reasonable doubt forever. Without a true confession, this case is done. It is over with. And we're not just saying that now, we're saying that forever. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'll be glad when this is over. Yeah. Okay, so what are you gonna tell them when you go in there and tell me what you're thinking? I think we just be honest that the DNA didn't help us and we're gonna continue to work on the case. Let me tell you something. You're never going to get there, and it's not your fault. But you're so sweet, you want to keep working, and it doesn't, it's not going to matter. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I understand. I do. Think of how you're going to tell them. Yeah. It's going to be tough. God, it's going to be It's going to be horrible. Yeah. It's going to be horrible. Yeah. Well, we've done all of our interviews, we've tested all the evidence, and we're not any better off than what we were. The DNA evidence actually hurt us being able to go any further with the case. See, things are different. 21 years ago, yeah. DNA was different than it is today. Mm -hmm. Today, there's a lot of protocols in place mm -hmm. so that you don't contaminate it. Mm -hmm. So. What that means is your DA has a right to always say all that DNA is built in reasonable doubt. I'm mm -hmm. not going to file this case. Mm -hmm. And we can't sit here and leave you with the thought that maybe one day that would, mm -hmm. it, that would make me crazy. Right. And I don't think it's fair to you because I don't think maybe one day is ever going to happen. Not in this lifetime. So and, and never? So, no, never. Mm -mm. So he's gotten away with it. Come on, Jackie. Come on. I know. I know, though. Come on, Jackie. No, it's okay. I know. Look. Oh. It's not your fault. It's okay. It's okay. This is why you have to know. You can't live the rest of your life calling this man and him exactly. trying to fix it. I know. You can't. You guys did all you could do. Because he can't fix it, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, don't cry, Kelly. No, last night we drove away. Terry said, I'm going to get him. I'm going to go interview more people. I'm going to test more stuff. He did. But he can't fix it. The good Lord one day will step in. It'll come to him. It'll happen. God works in mysterious ways. There's angels out there, and they are looking down, helping us get through all of this. I can hear my daughter. I can close my eyes and hear her voice, and Kaylee too. Those are my angels.
We were so hopeful, and then that DNA came back. And that's what's hurting us. It screws us. There's nothing else we can do, and it's time for us to... I don't want to say this, but it's time to move on. But I don't want him to think we've given up on him. And I think by moving, I mean, I know we got to move on. <laughs> and I'm so sorry for you. Oh, oh. I hope that they understand that Carrie and Scott and the Fort Wayne Police Department did everything they could. We just couldn't get there. And it's heartbreaking for all of us. I'm sorry. It's you okay. have to say home. Maybe when they have memories of Lisa and Kaylee, they can try to figure out a way to deal with their deaths as not murders that went unpunished, but just as a tragedy that happened so they can get rid of the anger and try and move on.